Good afternoon. The date is June 11th, 2021, and it's about 3 p.m., and we're in the Senate chambers of the Kansas State House in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, there's some work going on over in the House chamber, so we're conducting this interview in the Senate chamber. Uh, and so the question is whether or not does this ever fulfill a dream of yours to be sitting in this chamber in one of these senator seats? Or? I, I never did have that dream. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm uh, Alan Connor. I'm a 40-year-plus uh, state employee with majority of that uh, state service working in the Kansas Legislative Research Department the central nonpartisan research and budget staff for the legislature. And I'm currently with the Kansas Public Employees Retirement System. And today I'll be interviewing uh, the former representative John Solbach, who served 14 years in the legislature. He first served in the 1979 legislature uh, and then uh, serving for the next seven terms representing I think it was the 45th district, 45th was it the whole time? Um, mm -hmm. And it was in Douglas, Douglas County, I think mm -hmm. some Lawrence and some, or was it all? <laughs> it, some was Lawrence and, and some, some was the rural area, rural area usually happened. western Douglas County, well, all of western Douglas County, and, but it, it changed from time to time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, uh, the last reapportionment was an attempt to get rid of me. Oh. And by the numbers, I shouldn't have been reelected, but I was. <laughs> I'll be uh, conducting this interview on behalf of the Kansas Oral History Project, Incorporated, a not-for-profit corporation created for the purpose of interviewing legislators. Uh, the interviews will be made accessible to researchers and educators, and the interviews are funded in part by a grant from Humanities Kansas. The audio and video equipment is being operated by former Speaker Pro Tem David Heineman. And so we'll just start off and just have a little visit here. Okay. Uh, former Representative Solbach grew up in central Kansas, is that I correct? I did. I was born in Clay Center, Kansas. Clay Center. And we lived uh, north of Morganville at the time. Uh, Morganville is about 10 miles northwest of Clay Center. Clay Center, mm -hmm. yep. All right. Uh, and then you uh, attended Kansas State. I went to Kansas State for about a year. A year. And then what happened? And then I joined the Marines for three years. And it sounds like uh, just reading about uh, your experience in the Marines, uh, let's see, you led a 19-person unit, a combat unit in mm -hmm. Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, received a meritorious battlefield promotion, mm -hmm. uh, was wounded in action, mm -hmm. uh, and all that uh, uh, in terms of the information I thought was sort of interesting, all before you were able to vote. That's right. Uh, uh, David Heineman was one of those who introduced legislation to lower the voting age in, when you got to the legislature, didn't you, David? <laughs> yeah. um, and then after, was it three years of military service or? Three years. Three years, you, mm -hmm. you returned back to K-State mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and of course completed uh, that degree. I read while you were there, you helped establish a facility for international students mm -hmm. at Kansas mm -hmm. State. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after then graduating from K-State, uh, you decided to go down the road a ways and you went to graduate school in political science at the at University of Kansas. Mm -hmm. And then you got that degree and then you thought, how well, about, or... I, I didn't get that degree. Oh, you didn't get I, that degree. I, I went for a year. I was working on a master's degree and I had the opportunity to continue with the master's degree or put it on hold and go to law, to law school. school. And my advisor said, if you're going to law school, forget about the political <laughs> science degree. <laughs> So I did. Yeah, yeah. So, um, of course, you served in the legislature. You have certainly had a successful career in the practice of law in, in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, of course, lots of different things, but uh, one of them, of course, the Governmental Ethics Commission. You served right. on that. I, I continue to serve on that, and I, I sort of uh, informally appointed as its uh, hearing officer. Oh. So, <laughs> so we've done some Zoom hearings some in, and some in-person hearings. I'm sure you heard some interesting subjects we, through we the have. years. We have. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then while you were in the House, though, you were, of course, served on numerous uh, committees, uh, elections, co uh, commercial and financial institutions. No, I, I was oh, never on that. Not, not on commercial and financial? No, I was okay. on the energy, elections, uh, agriculture, and ways and means, and judiciary, right. which I chaired the last That's few That's right, years. yeah, as chairperson mm -hmm. on judiciary. Um, and then, uh, of course, and then ways and means slash appropriations, mm -hmm. and then it <laughs> morphed, morphed into that. So it, it was ways and means when I came to the legislature, and I think uh, uh, Braden, uh, Jim Braden changed that to appropriations because 
Ways and Means uh, in the Congress, at least, is the Taxation Tax Committee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, All right, well, very good. So let's uh, kind of go back maybe before you were in the legislature, and uh, why don't you just tell me a little bit about something about your life before you entered the uh, legislature. You said you were uh, born in central Kansas. Um, had your family ever been involved in politics before you ran for the House? My great-great-grandfather uh, was elected to the House in 1890. Wow. That was the first time the Republicans lost the majority. He was a member, he was a populist. Populist. Uh, he had served in the Civil War and had always been a Republican. Uh, his uh, first cousin served uh, in the uh, Kansas legislature in 1870. And then his nephew served in the legislature in the in, in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. His nephew um, uh, was uh, he came back to, from serving in the legislature, and he says, "I ain't ever going back there again." <laughs> he says, "That legislature is bought and sold by the railroads," oh. and uh, they were in the milling business and uh, wow. the the uh, the Hoffmans had the Hoffman Mills in uh, Enterprise Kansas and they depended upon those uh, low freight rates to get their product <laughs> to market and the rate freight rates were set by the Congress wow. and over and uh, and uh, the US senator at that time was uh, selected by the joint session of the House and the Senate and our US senator was uh, was uh, uh, his name escapes me, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was a longtime U.S. senator. He used to say we Kansas had two U.S. senators: a Union Pacific senator and a Santa Fe senator. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the senator would get together with the lobbyists and give them the names of the legislators right. he wanted uh, them to support, so yeah. that he could get another six-year term. And uh, John Ingalls was the oh, senator's mm -hmm. name. And John Ingalls did that in, in 1890, right. but the Farmers, Farmers Alliance was, was rising. Uh, C.B. Hoffman, my great-great-grandfather's nephew, helped to finance <laughs> that. And uh, he, and, uh, and they, uh, uh, they, they first were gonna try to influence the election and then they decided, what the hell, let's run <laughs> for the for legislature. <laughs> so 92 of them got elected in the House, and uh, they defeated 92 wow. Republican candidates, and they had a clear majority. And uh, when they met, uh, they, when they met to, to determine who they would uh, uh, nominate for the, to the United States Senate, and uh, 92 House members and I think six members of the Senate all voted, they called themselves the Dauntless 98. <laughs> they voted to remove Ingalls and to replace him with uh, William Peffer, mm -hmm. who was the, a lawyer from, uh, and a newspaper publisher from Fredonia and Topeka. And so uh, William Peffer was a bearded guy and uh, Teddy Roosevelt had unkind <laughs> things to say about him, <laughs> as did uh, William <laughs> Allen White. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, but that was the end of uh, John Ingalls' career. And John Ingalls, not only was he uh, in the pocket of the railroads, but uh, he also uh, 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 would said some uh, negative things about farmers and their ability to raise corn. <laughs> and he also was adamantly opposed to giving women the right to vote. Oh, wow. And uh, so uh, Peffer, but it took him about 30 two ballots to decide on William <laughs> Peffer. And I still have the little notebook that my great-great-grandfather used to tally the votes. Yeah, uh, uh, neat. That, uh, William yeah. Peffer finally got him majority and they stuck together. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he became our United States Senator. Yeah, yeah. So clearly a long lineage of uh, public service. Well, I, I've learned a lot about uh, Michael Sen. He was a prolific uh, writer. When he came to this country, uh, at age uh, 15, he had read the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, mm. uh, which was published in 1852 and translated into about 20 different languages. He read it in a, in a German mm. version when he was 14 in 1854. And uh, so when he came here, he, 
he was very anti-slavery. And when the Civil War broke out, he joined a Union unit uh, through, uh, uh, you know, when he was, uh, he had gone to Western Kansas to work in the silver mines out there. Hmm. Western Kansas at that time went all the way to the Continental <laughs> Divide. Uh, but uh, when he joined the Union Army, that had become Colorado, Colorado Territory. Yeah. And so wow. he was uh, part of that Colorado unit. Yeah. So He's, your your personal interest in politics, was that, did that uh, uh, I, I, high school or college uh, or after you came back? I, I probably uh, secretly wanted to run for public office since I was a small boy. And, uh, <laughs> your parents, and, any encouragement no, there? No, no, not really. <laughs> not, 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 my, not my parents. Uh, and uh, uh, when I, 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 I ran... Uh, I had a, uh, Russell Getter was my political advisor. He had been my uh, professor at KU, political science professor at KU. And actually, he had, uh, he had uh, called up Betty Jo Charlton because he's going to be out of town. He told her, make sure that John Solbach files for the <laughs> House. And so she called me and asked me to do that. She was not in the legislature then. That's she was. Time, yeah. And uh, so I filed. Uh, I didn't know anything about what I was doing, but he did. And he helped us uh, formulate a plan and lay out that plan. And we executed that plan and, and we got elected. I was uh, told that, uh, he, he, he told me, he said, you know, uh, no Democrat's been elected in this uh, seat, as far as we know, forever. But he said, uh, uh, there, there's only about... Uh, uh, the, the Republican candidate is going to get about uh, 4,000 votes. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do to take them away from him. He's going to get them. Uh, it's just going to happen. He's a young lawyer like you, and uh, he's a credible candidate, and he's going to get those votes. Mm -hmm. And there, you can't take any of them away from him. And you're going to get about uh, 3,000 votes or 3,100 <laughs> votes, and there's nothing he can do to take any of those votes away from you. But he said you need to go out and find an extra thousand people to go to the polls and vote for you and you can you can win this seat and so that's what we did and on, at, uh, on election night uh, my opponent had i think 38 to 3900 votes and that was enough to win any house seat in kansas that year mm. But I had 4,200. 4,200, yeah. Um, and was that, in, was that in the primary? The, no, that was in the general. Because there I was a the, primary. There was a primary, and I won Mike, the primary. Uh, Tara Bolas, Bolas or yes, something? Yes, yeah. And that uh, one was 69. Um, uh, yeah, I think you got 69% of the vote yeah. in that primary. Yeah. Uh, and then Ken White Knight? Ken White Knight, was, uh, he had a primary also. He defeated two other Republican yeah, candidates. And then, that's and then and Ken, Ken was a nice guy. He, uh, he and I uh, got along well. Uh, we, he, I told him that uh, uh, he told me about uh, listening to the debate that we had on one of the uh, radio mm -hmm. shows. And I said, oh, I hadn't seen, I hadn't listened to that. And he said, well, I've got it on tape. Come to my house and we'll do it. So <laughs> we were during the campaign. I went to his house. We had drank wine and had cheese and listened to that debate. <laughs> but uh, he, he uh, didn't think that I could win. And he kind of felt sorry, sorry for me. But, uh, he surprised you. But, it, but it, that's not how it yeah. turned out. And ironically, he went to work for my largest political com contributor after the election. election. Um, the guy that owned the Chuck E. Cheese, uh, oh, mm -hmm. what was his name? Uh, he, he, went to, he took $100 million and went to Texas. He was going to double or triple it, and he lost $100 million in Texas. <laughs> but Ken White Knight stayed down there, yeah. and, and he's still living in Texas, and evidently he's had a successful yeah. career. Wow, yeah. So in 1980 then, I noticed uh, you were unopposed in the primary. Uh, and in 1980, and then for the next five elections, you never had a primary opponent. Uh huh. Um, right. I didn't have any. Uh, that was the only primary that I had. I, uh, Forrest Wall did approach me one time and and said, uh, uh, "Why? I, I'm thinking of running in the primary against you. I don't expect to defeat you, but I just want to. Uh, I oh, just want to have a forum where I can say th things that I need want to say." <laughs> and I said. Forrest, that's the worst idea I ever heard in my life. I said, please don't do that. And he didn't. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then in the general election, 1980, uh, it was Kent Snyder, and you won with 57% of the vote okay. in that one. Mm -hmm. um, in 1982, you were unopposed even in the general election. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. you must have been doing something right, or at least with your constituents. Uh, Maybe, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> but then, in 1984, 1986, and 1990, a person by the name of Martha Parker ran against you three different times yeah. on the Republican side, of course. And of course, you, you beat her with 60 percent, 56, 52 percent. Yeah. Um, and so she... Yeah. Martha is a, a nice lady. Uh, she, uh, she has a talent for... She had a talent for snapping victory from the jaws of defeat. <laughs> <laughs> or snapping, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, is she she was uh, she, she's a very forceful person and she made enemies very mm. easily but she thought that was her district and she should have it and uh, and she should have won in in 1990 because the, the way that it was redistricted oh, yes, yeah. uh, we looked at the numbers and if I got all the votes that I got in the district that I kept and the, all the votes that the quality de democratic candidate got in the oh, vote in, in the areas that I were given to me, uh, I, I shouldn't have won the election. But uh, we thought we, we would win. I didn't want to leave to let down my colleagues like uh, <laughs> Joan Wagon and others. We were close to getting a majority. Yeah. And uh, well, we thought about not running because, uh, because of that and other factors. But uh, we worked very hard in the new areas, and I didn't win any of those precincts. Mm. I lost every single one of them. But I sent, came so close, it didn't make any difference. Yeah, we did. still won. Yeah, yeah. That very first campaign, uh, do you remember how much you spent? Uh, I uh, spent $1,000. $1,000. Yeah. Uh, I, we, I think, well, it, it, was, it was probably more than that. It was probably a couple thousand dollars, but we put $1,000 of our own money into mm -hmm. it. Wow. So, and a lot of door-to-door, uh, -door, is that the a secret? A lot of door-to-door. -door. <laughs> if you and, want to get elected, yeah. <laughs> at and least in Kansas. We, <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, we knew, we did our research and we knew who we were going to be talking to before we ever knocked mm -hmm. on that door. And we knew who lived in that house. We knew who was registered to vote, what they were registered as, how many times they had voted in the last several elections. And uh, that helped us to uh, target uh, the people we needed to target to get an extra thousand people to, mm -hmm. the, to the polls. Yeah. And that's what we did. Wow. Wow. So uh, you, you got elected? I came, did. Came to the state house, mm -hmm. rolled, into, ro rolled into town. And uh, one of my favorite questions, of course, is uh, do you remember the first time you went to the microphone at the, the well of the house to, on a bill? Um, I don't remember the first time, but I remember the first time I thought of going to the <laughs> microphone. John Sutter from Wyandotte County mm -hmm. was my seatmate. Yep. And I, <laughs> they were debating some bill, and I had something important to say, and I reached up and I pushed my, oh. my white light, and John Sutter reached over and he pushed my white light off. <laughs> I said, I wanna, I've got something that I want to say. And he says, you you need to be watching what's going on. He says, if you if you have something important to say, somebody else will say it, and you haven't been here long enough to make a fool of yourself yet. <laughs> so that was the first time I thought of going to the microphone, but I and I didn't. <laughs> I, you I, took his advice. I then? took his advice. And John Sutter was not someone that was I thought was a great legislator, or someone that I respected highly, but. That was good advice from him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so there was, we talked a little bit about some of the committees like judiciary, appropriations, ways and means, and so forth. Of course, um, agriculture. But uh, was uh, your favorite one, was it judiciary? Judiciary or? was really my favorite. And of course, because, you got the chair of that, too, at one right. point. Right. I was ranking minority member for many times. I, uh, I worked with Mike O'Neill. I saw the nice comments that he made about me in his interview. He called me a friend, which disturbed me a little bit <laughs> because I came over here not to make friends among lawyers and among legislators and, and staff and lobbyists, but to represent my constituents. I enjoyed the collegiality and I, these were my, these were colleagues and we shared a lot. We knew a lot about each other. 
But I wouldn't, uh, I don't think I'd call up Mike O'Neill if I had a flat tire on the highway and ask him to come <laughs> help me. Uh, but I, I, I hate to, and on the Ethics Commission, we actually had mm -hmm. Mike O'Neill in mm -hmm. front of us one time. I did not recuse myself. I felt I could be fair. And we determined that he hadn't committed an ethical mm -hmm. violation. And we did it based upon the evidence, not upon right. friendship. Sure. And the House uh, later tried him on the same thing under their rules, and they came to the same conclusion mm -hmm. we did. Uh, uh, there was, a, uh, it didn't necessarily look right or smell right, but he'd walked up to the line, but he hadn't crossed hadn't it. Crossed. Yeah. yeah. But I, I know Mike uh, real well. We, we, we did lots and lots of uh, conference committees together. I. I, I think I said one time that uh, I know him so well I can tell you what he's going to say before he even says it. <laughs> and there weren't a lot of partisan things that uh, came before the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and, uh, and we, and we uh, worked well together. He's a very, very bright guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, I guess you kind of that raised the question you talked about coming from your district to represent mm -hmm. them. And mm -hmm. so were there times during your legislative service, I guess, that whole thing of uh, are you vote, are you voting what you think is best yeah. or maybe what you've heard and you think this is what your constituents want? want you to Betty Joe Charlton used to say, I was elected to go to Topeka, develop good judgment, and then to use that good judgment for my constituents, to benefit my constituents. And uh, I never did surveys. And uh, because uh, I'm here to study the issues, those the surveys don't have, don't aren't answered by people who study the issues. I'm supposed to use my good judgment, and I'm supposed to know my constituents well enough to know how I should vote on a particular thing. A a good example is uh, we had uh, we were dedicating the Lane University at uh, in Lecompton. Mm -hmm and we needed $4,000 for furniture. Uh, David Eisenhower was going to come and be the keynote speaker. And uh, so we, uh, Jane Eldridge was the senator, and I was a house member representing that area, and we, it was our job to get that $4,000 in there. And, and uh, we put it in in the House, and it uh, got over to the Senate. Oh, wait a minute. The, 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 uh, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Jane Eldridge had it put in the Senate, and it came over to the House. Mike Hayden took it out. <laughs> and, I, and I called up Mike Hayden, and I said, you know, we need that $4,000. <laughs> and he says, I said, well, how come you took that out? And he says, he said, John, we're going to have something to bargain with the Senate on. <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, are you saying that you'll see that it gets in there? It'll get in there. <laughs> I said, are you asking me not to come down to the floor of the House and try to put it in uh, as an amendment? Eh, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> and Mike, Mike Hayden never, as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, ever allowed an amendment to go on in the floor of the House that he didn't support. Wow. But I knew he would keep his word. Yeah. You know, he's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. He's probably a lot more conservative than I am. But I knew... I knew he would keep his word. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, when it came to the floor of the House, the, the gallery was full of people from the Compton, and they were calling me and they were asking me to, to take an amendment down there, and Jesse Branson was <laughs> on me, and, and she said, if you're not going to do it, I'm, I'm going to do it. I said, no, I said, this is what's going to happen. I said, we're not going to do that. If we go down there and screw with Mike Hayden, we all don't get it. I said, it'll to be taken care of. And I explained that to my constituents from Lecompton, and uh, they accepted it, but they didn't <laughs> believe me. And so the Senate omnibus bill was being negotiated down in the Senate uh, committee room. Mm -hmm. And Jesse Branson called me. Your friend Mike Hayden is out here, and you he, don't he, he offer that 4,000. He takes it out. Man, man, man. And I went down there and went and sat in the back of the room. And Hayden was on one side of the room mm -hmm. with his two confreres, right. and Bogina was Bogina. on the other side of the room with his two confreres, and Jane Eldridge was standing <laughs> behind them. And uh, I, uh, I watched it, and 
uh, Hayden, uh, 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 Gus Bogina offered uh, an amendment that included the $4,000. And Hayden, without blinking an eye, without consulting with his conferees, rejected it and made a counteroffer. And evidently, this had been going on for some time. And uh, so Gus Bugina said, we need a break. <laughs> and he took his two confries and Gene Eldridge back in his office. And they were gone for quite a while. And finally, they come back out. You could see that Jane had been crying. Oh. And uh, uh, oh. wow. they evidently told her, Hayden's not going to accept that, and we're not going to offer it again. And she, she had to accept that. And, and, and she had been in tears, you could tell. Oh. And... Uh, uh, Begina sat down with his conferees, and he makes uh, an, an offer of amendment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hayden reaches over and grabs uh, his two conferees around the neck and <laughs> spits into his spittoon that he's got there. He's a chewing red man there. And uh, they consult a little bit. And Hayden makes a counteroffer, including the $4,000. <laughs> And did it stay it, in? It, it stayed in. It stayed in. Yeah. <laughs> David Eisenhower, when he was, uh, when I was a little boy, I went hunting with my grandfather one uh, weekend. And we, we were hunting pheasants and quail, and we went out on his farms, and we, we hunted all day long. Didn't get a single pheasant or a quail. We were about to go back to the house, and he said, well, let's walk down this waterway. So we walked down that waterway. And a rabbit jumped up, and we shot the rabbit. We got back to the house, and my grandfather comes inside. We've been uh, walking all day. We were tired, and he turns on the TV, and the news is on. And the news that day was that David Eisenhower and his grandfather had gone hunting at Camp David, oh. but they didn't get anything. And my grandfather says, well, at least we got a rabbit. <laughs> well, I told David Eisenhower that story. He says, I remember that hunting trip. He <laughs> <And> says, <nothing>. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I mean, you mentioned like with Hayden uh, that his word, I mean, that you could, you could count when, on that. When he gave his word, he kept his word. Yeah. yeah. And so over your time here, the 14 years. That it, was it, the it, case with most people. Most people? Yeah, you give your word, you keep your word. If you go back on your word, your credibility as a legislator mm. is down the tubes. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so I, uh, uh, I never traded uh, one vote for another vote. I know they did it in the Senate all the time. That's one of the reasons I didn't have any dreams <laughs> of coming to the Senate. But I, I, I don't think that I ever did in the House. Uh, you voted how you needed to vote, and uh, if something had merit, you voted for it. If it didn't, you voted against it. And you didn't tell one legislator, I'll vote oh. for this if you'll vote for that. Uh, well, uh, 90... Two, I think it was, uh, went winter with chairman of the, House, of the Senate Judiciary, and I was uh, chairman of the House Judiciary. And we had both been, we are both statutory members of the Uniform Laws Commission, and we had brought back uh, the Uniform Conservation Easement Law. Should have been uncontroversial, and uh, we worked it through the House, and we uh, the House Committee, and I carried it on the floor of the House, and it didn't get as many votes as I thought it should get, but it passed, mm -hmm. went to the Senate. I called up Went Winter, and I says, uh, when you have a hearing on that bill, uh, uh, give me a call. I want to come over and testify. He says, sure, John. What is it again? And I, I told him. And he calls me back the next day. He says, that bill didn't come to my committee. I said, well, where did it go? He says, it went to Ross Doyne's committee on, on easements and utilities. Oh. I said, it's not that kind of an easement. He says, well, I know it isn't. And uh, I said, you call him up and you tell him that it needs to be in judiciary. It's a complicated <laughs> issue. And Went Winter called me back the next day and he says, yeah. Dwayne ain't going to let that bill go. And I said, well, I'll call him. So I called up Ross and I said, Ross, you don't want this bill in your committee. It's a complicated judiciary issue and it needs to be in the judiciary committee. You, surely you've got enough work to do without <laughs> having to worry about this. He says, no. He says, I think I'll keep that bill. And I says, well, why? Yeah. He says, well, there's this lawyer from Lawrence who's chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and there's this lawyer from Lawrence who's chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and I may want something from those lawyers <laughs> before this session is over. 
<laughs> I said, what do you want, Ross? <laughs> Ross used to be my senator from oh, Clay from County, Clay, Kansas. Yeah, yeah. And he said, there's this little bill uh -oh. that puts all the pesticide regulation underneath the Secretary of Agriculture, mm. and it needs to pass. Mm. And uh, you get me that bill through the House, and I'll get your conservation easement bill out, and we'll get it <laughs> past the Senate. And I, I never traded votes, uh, but I looked at the bill that he wanted us to pass. It needed to pass. Pat Ross is a farmer over in Douglas County, I think, and farms in eight different uh, jurisdictions, <laughs> and he'd have eight different <laughs> sets oh, of regulations oh, sure. to, right, yeah. Yeah, for the pesticides that he used. It needed to be, even though we all, many people didn't like the Secretary of Agriculture at the time, I don't remember, I don't, it wasn't Brownback. <laughs> well, maybe it was Brownback. Uh, but uh, uh, it needed to be under one authority. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, I didn't pay much attention to it. It went through another committee, came to the floor on general orders, no big deal. And, and uh, uh, then it came on final action. I was over talking to some other legislator and it came up for a final vote. And I looked up there and I was the only one who wasn't voting. And I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I had to call Ross Doyne and tell him what was going on. And I, you asked the legislator that I was talking to if I could use his phone. I called up Ross Dwayne. I said, Ross, your, your pesticide bill is on the floor of the House on final action. He said, what's the vote? I said, it's 62 to 62. He says, how are you voting? <laughs> I said, I haven't voted yet. <laughs> he says, well, you can get that out of the hole. I'm there, man. <laughs> so I raised my hand yes. and voted yes, and it passed the House. And Ross did keep his word. He got it out of his committee and he got it on the floor of the House. But Gus Bogina put an amendment on it on the floor of the Senate. Just made one up like <laughs> legislators sometimes do. And it wasn't necessary an amendment. Uh, but where he put it screwed up the whole, the whole bill. If, if he'd put it a couple words earlier, it'd have been okay. And uh, so we got over to the House, and I voted. I moved to not concur, and the conference committee be appointed. And I called it up Ross Dwayne and told him what the problem was. I said, uh, I don't like his amendment. It's not necessary, but we can leave it in there. But we've got to move it a couple <laughs> words over. And Mike, uh, I think Mike Davis, uh, former dean of the law mm -hmm. school, came mm -hmm. and testified about why we needed to do that. And Ross agreed. All six members signed the conference committee report. Ross could not get it through the Senate. Oh. And uh, he said, John, I, I tried, I, but uh, I, I did what I said I was going to do. I kept my word, but he says, I, I can't get the votes again. And so I called up uh, Went Winter and I said, uh, do we have a little bill in Judiciary oh. Conference Committees that we really don't need that we can gut and mend this into? He says, yeah, the Senate Bill 202 or whatever it was. So uh, that's what we did. And the Senate wasn't willing to correct a bill that hadn't passed, but they were willing Indicate. to correct one that had passed. <laughs> we sent that, we, uh, and so, well, I, I went ahead and moved to concur in the Senate amendments finally. And we sent the flawed bill to the governor's office. And I, I called up Governor Fenning and I said, don't sign that bill. We're going to send up a, a corrected bill. Sign the corrected bill. Veto oh, this bill, yeah. but don't veto it right now. <laughs> and uh, so she, they, they said they would. And we passed the corrected bill. And I was home uh, in the shower. The phone rang, and I went out soaking wet, opened the, uh, picked up the phone. It was the governor's office. Now, which of these bills do <laughs> we sign, and which do we veto? <laughs> I said, sign the Senate bill and veto <laughs> the House bill. <laughs> Yeah, that's how we got the conservation easement bill. It's been a marvelous piece of legislation. It's been used so many times yeah, by so I many bet. people. Yeah, you mentioned uh, leadership speakers and mm -hmm. Senate presidents. I, I was thinking under your and you're in the House side, you were Wendell Lady, and then Fred Weaver was the minority leader, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then Hayden was speaker, and then it was Fred Weaver, and then Marvin Barkas as, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as minority leader, and then Braden and Barkas. 
and then Barkas, of course, was speaker, mm -hmm. and then Robert Miller was mm -hmm. um, the minority leader. Yeah. Just your relationships with any of those, or uh, style I, of management? Or? Uh, Wendell Lady uh, was reputed to, uh, to uh, he, the, he wasn't a forgiving person, mm. but I found him to be one of the most liberal members of the Kansas House. <laughs> Uh, he was a Republican from Johnson County. He was an engineer. And uh, uh, Robert Miller was chairman of the Energy Committee when I first got elected. And uh, one of the first things that they did was uh, we had this uh, Wolf Creek bill. Uh, the the uh, uh, bunch of rural electric cooperatives got together and they decided they wanted to buy a piece of Wolf Creek. And, and the electric cooperatives that wouldn't join them, they cut them off from using any of their lines to wheel cheap electric uh -huh. power from hydroelectric dams in mm -hmm. Missouri. And my electric cooperative, uh, head of my electric cooperative, was just, you know, he was apoplectic, you know. <laughs> it, and, uh, uh, but they were going to uh, take the uh, nuclear power plant out from underneath the mm -hmm. Kansas Corporation Commission. And Miller determined that if we can maintain control of that bill and handle it right, we could amend it so that the, 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 the wheeling of the power by the, these non-members uh, of KEPCO, I guess is what it's called, mm -hmm. Uh, would continue to continue to get power, and uh, we could also keep uh, Wolf Creek under the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, Kansas Corporation mm -hmm. Commission. But we had two Democrats on that committee that were problematic: uh, Irving Niles and Anita Niles. And uh, <laughs> Robert Miller told me, he says, "If we have any anti-nuclear folks come over <laughs> here and testify, we're going to lose their votes." <laughs> And so he sent me around to talk to every anti-nuclear group in the state and ask them not to come and testify, and none of them did. Yeah, wow. And we got those two Niles votes, and we kept control of that. Uh, KEPCO got a lot of what they wanted, but uh, Wolf kept, kept, it was uh, continued to be under the Corporation Commission, and my little electric cooperative got the exactly. wheel of that power in there. Uh, when we took the majority, we had it by one vote. Uh, there were some contested races. Uh, 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 Elaine Wells uh, had uh, changed from being a, a Democrat to a Republican. She said, I'm tired of being in the minority. So she became a Republican. <laughs> and, Time means everything. <laughs> and and her, her vote was, uh, I think, one or two, one, one vote uh, it separated her and her opponent. And we had one... Uh, uh, they appointed a committee. I, myself, and Michael O'Neill and some others served on that committee. And uh, there were two votes that were in contest. And one of them, the voter had written in next to Mike Hayden's name, a boob with nuts. And he'd written in next to Joe and Finney's name, and not with boobs. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and we ended up throwing that ballot out. I think that was for Elaine Wallace's opponent anyway. And then there was a faxed-in ballot from a soldier in, uh, I believe, in uh, Iraq. Mm -hmm. It was not legal, mm -hmm. but it was clear what his intent was, and the fax is the only way he could get it in. We went ahead and counted that. Elaine Wells won. Mm -hmm. And she was still in the minority. <laughs> 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 but uh, some of the Republicans believed that they could siphon off a couple of Democratic uh, members by mm -hmm. giving them committee chairmen yeah. or something like that, and they could retain the majority. And R.H. Miller, in a meeting with his Republican colleagues, he was the leader, the minority leader, and he said, no, we're not going to do that. They won the majority fair and square, and we're going to play by those rules. There was a statesman. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I, I did a <clears throat> kind of a count, and it looked, looked like over your career, uh, you, your name was on over a little over 200 on bills or resolutions, concurrent mm -hmm. resolutions. Uh -huh. um, and of course, 
resolutions honoring Fred Weaver, Harold Dick. Uh, one I noticed was commending the Sunshine Biscuit Incorporated for producing Kansas style wheat crackers. Your name was on that. Uh, as I'm a, glad as I was a co-sponsor of that one, I will tell you that. <laughs> and then of course the, the, I guess maybe the usual Lawrence High School girls basketball team went yeah. in there. 1984, yeah. well, you, the 6A yeah. title. And the, the, those are things that you forget about. Yeah. I sent over one time for a list of bills that my great great grandfather had mm -hmm. sponsored or co sponsored, and the, story, and the State Library sent me those. Mm -hmm. And several of them were very similar to bills that I had sponsored <laughs> or co sponsored. One of them uh, having to do with classifying property for taxation Ooh, purposes, yeah. we actually passed. Pass. But it took us almost a hundred years to get it done. <laughs> yeah, and your first bill that had a name on it, uh, with your name on it, uh, maybe some others, but it was uh, abandoned railroad property and acquisition by the state. Uh -huh. It's not whether that was uh, early rails to trail. It was. <laughs> it probably was. Yeah. Yeah, and then of course a lot of other ones, and certainly I think areas or subject that certainly, you know, adult care home qualifications and wages of employees, mm, yeah. residential landlord tenant yeah. act. Uh, I was in the minority for 12 years. And if you're going to get anything done in the minority, you have to be a guerrilla fighter. And you got to find Republicans that will take the credit for it, even <laughs> though it might be your idea. And you have to uh, amend things onto things. Uh, the worst thing that you can do is put your name on a bill. It, uh, people, will, if they don't like it, will attach tail cans to it. Mike uh, Glover was known as a marijuana smoker, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, he uh, he introduced a little juvenile bill one time, and it got over to the Senate, and they amended it into a drug bust bill. Still had his <laughs> name, name on it, uh, and uh, I. Uh, uh, later in my legislative career, I learned that the best thing to do was to go to a committee and ask the committee to introduce the bill, or to introduce it as a judiciary committee bill. When I was in the, when I uh, chaired the judiciary yeah. committee. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I mean looking through your sessions, in you know whether it was taxation or education, of course budget, gaming, lottery, children's trust fund community corrections, all the, I mean, are there a couple of topics, highway plan, mm -hmm. any that really, I guess, that really stick out as maybe accomplishments, not just for you, but for the body? That I, I think, I, I haven't researched this for sure, but I think that the two years that I chaired the Judiciary Committee are probably one, two of the most productive years mm -hmm. of that committee in Kansas history. Wow. We, took, we, we got our 70th bill, <clears throat> when the Agriculture Committee got its first bill. And, <laughs> and my secretary used to say, stay late and oh, lock herself into a closet, <laughs> listen to those committee hearings and so she could produce the minutes for the meeting the next day. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and I, had, uh, I had some re very remarkable people on that uh, committee. Mm -hmm. um, and they ought to, they should be given credit for a lot of what we accomplished. Uh, I believe that Kathleen Stabilius was on the committee to begin with. And I think she went and she later went off the committee. You don't think she was? <laughs> you don't think she was ever on the judiciary? You weren't, you weren't, uh, you weren't judiciary? Yeah. Okay. But Kathleen was on there, I think, briefly, wasn't she? She was chair of the Bed State. I know she was. That's why she left yeah. the judiciary. But, well, in, anyway, uh, uh, one of my members ran for governor it was, and, was, and was secretary of administration that, that right over here. Uh, several of my members got elected to the Senate. Uh, one became minority leader, one became majority leader, one became speaker of the House, one became secretary of labor, one became uh, lieutenant governor, one became governor. Seven. One uh, was elected to Congress, and uh, the, these were very, uh, very uh, uh, accomplished people. And uh, I, I remember I was sitting. Uh, uh, Mary Jane Johnson was my seatmate uh, on my 
on my left. She's never been left to, to, left to me <laughs> on anything, but uh, she, she chaired uh, the health committee, I think, mm -hmm. and she uh, got the ADA, the Kansas version of the ADA, and she said, would you take that bill? And she says, it's too complicated for me. So we agreed to take the bill, and it was referred to judiciary, and I, I turned it over to Mark Parkinson and two other members to serve as a subcommittee. You, maybe you were one of those. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they did a marvelous job working that bill, and uh, we got it. They got, we got it out of the committee and passed the flat pattern and became yeah. law. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so clearly you kept the revisor's office very busy those two years. Uh, yeah, we probably did. We probably Crunching did. Crunching out that many bills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned reapportionment, and you were through two of them, is that right? Uh, I think at least two of them. Yeah. Uh, I was on the reapportionment committee, mm -hmm. and I kind of cut my teeth on the legislative process uh, uh, because they divided up the state, and they uh, they gave so many districts to each member of the yeah. committee. And I was working on uh, reapportioning uh, Robin Leach's district, uh, Ambrose Dempsey's district, mm. and the three districts in Lawrence, then there would be four districts in yeah. Lawrence. But <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, Robin Leach used to lobby me day in and day out. He wanted Kickapoo Township. Oh. He said, I gotta have Kickapoo Township. I says, uh, I said, look, uh, Ambrose Dempsey can't get elected without no. Kickapoo Township. And, uh, but he kept at me and kept at me and kept at me. We ultimately gave Kickapoo Township to Ambrose Dempsey. Yeah. And in the next election, he was elected only because he had Kickapoo <laughs> Township. Robin Leach didn't have any, any trouble. Uh, the last reapportionment I was not part of. But, uh, and, and I had no idea what was going on uh, in that uh, I was busy uh, with other things. But when I looked at the final map, it was clear that they were trying to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and I did the numbers and uh, uh, I shouldn't have been able to be, get, get reelected. Yeah, yeah. So do you think did. that reapportionment process, I mean, does it work? I mean, uh, it We, uh, we dealt with uh, the requirements that they be within 5% or something mm -hmm. like that, and they be contiguous and compact. Uh, and that has some uh, beneficial effect on reapportionment, but it probably ought to go to an independent commission. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the there was a new, with the first reapportionment, there was a new district in Lawrence. Uh, uh, there was my district, there was Glover's district, there was uh, 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 John Vogel's district, mm -hmm. and then there was a new district. It was the only new district in the state. Linda, Linda Laney was livid that Lawrence got the new <laughs> district, but there wasn't anything that could be done about it. That's just where just the numbers, the numbers. <laughs> ended up. And uh, it, I, I designed that district so that uh, Either a Republican or a Democrat can get elected. I, I was trying to be fair. Yeah. And uh, Morris Kay stepped in and got a hold of John Vogel and said, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> this is going to be the Republican district. And he gave John Vogel a map, and John Vogel went to the floor of the House. And if John Vogel takes something to the floor of the House, it passes. Yeah, it and, uh, and so it uh, took, uh, uh, that became the, the new district. And it was supposed to be a district designed for Went Winter Jr. Mm -hmm. And Went Winter Jr. ran in that district, but the Democratic candidate was Jesse Branson. Well, Jesse Branson was, <laughs> voted, was married to Vernon Branson, a pediatrician who delivered oh. almost everybody who was in that district. <laughs> and she, uh, but there were th several powerful women that uh, Arnold Berman and Went Winter got crosswise mm -hmm. with, Jesse Branson, uh, and, and several others, and uh, uh, and uh, even though Jane Eldridge was a uh, was a Republican, uh, they uh, they didn't oppose her. They, they may have helped helped her a little bit, and uh, so uh, Berman lost that seat to Jane Eldridge, and Winter lost that seat <laughs> to Jesse Branson. Yeah. 
It, I know Jesse Ranson was uh, sort of the Energizer Bunny when it came to constituent services. It, oh it, my goodness, it she was. Be... And, and Jesse Ranson didn't feel that anything was worthwhile unless she'd worked hard to get it. And she insisted on working hard. Uh, she'd stay late. Oh. She was real proud of the fact that at two o'clock in the morning she was stuck in an elevator that malfunctioned. <laughs> <laughs> proved that she, she was, was she was here. Uh, yeah. But uh, but. You know, Jesse would work on things, uh, but you know, Jess, Jesse, uh, she she would uh, lobby on behalf of KU, and and uh, Jack Shriver was on the KU subcommittee, and she was in Jack Shriver's office every day, uh, wanting to increase <laughs> KU's budget. The Jack Shriver pigeonholed me, and he says. If that woman comes to my office one more time, I'm going to cut a million dollars out of the KU budget. <laughs> uh, let's see, you mentioned, uh, of course, Governor Finney, and you would have worked with, in some manner, Governor Carlin, of course, Governor Hayden, and Governor uh, Finney, uh -huh. any, over those 14 years, any yeah, much we, interaction? Uh, or? We, we did. I, uh, we, the big piece of legislation that we worked on in 92 was uh, sentencing guidelines. Um, and uh, uh, we had research that showed that there were two justice systems in this state, one for white people and one for people who weren't white. And I think once you find out that that's the case, you have an obligation to try to do something about it under the Constitution. And so sentencing guidelines was uh, what we tried to do about it. And they didn't, they weren't implemented exactly how I thought they should have been. And they weren't perfect in every way. And this, uh, the Senate uh, tightened them up more than I thought they should have been tightened up. But uh, I wanted to make sure that the governor was on board. And so I scheduled a meeting with her. And I had an hour to meet with her. And I spent the hour talking about the sentencing guidelines and why we needed them and what they were and yada, yada, yada. And she sat and listened to me for an hour. And then when my hours was up, her staff came in and she stood up and she came over and she grabbed me by the hand and she pulled me in real close and she said, if you repeal the criminal abortion statute, I'll veto the whole thing. <laughs> but I said, uh, Governor, I appreciate you telling me that because if we do that, we'll do it in a separate bill. <laughs> she told me in that meeting that, uh, you know, she was opposed to the death penalty and she's she said, uh, uh, they aren't going to pass the death penalty. They don't want it. And they know that if they pass it, I'll sign it. So they're not going to pass it. And I kind of shook my head and I thought, I, I'm not sure you're right, Governor. <laughs> and we never had the death penalty when I was uh, in the legislature. But, uh, but uh, uh, when I left, uh, Governor Finney got it on her desk and she signed it. It's a, it's a, it's not as uh, as broad as some. It's a narrow death penalty, but it's still there. Uh, Bob Fry used to go down to the floor of the house, and and he used to carry the death penalty bill, and he would always give a lawyerly speech about why it should be passed. It would it was passed in the house, but yeah. it would either stall in the Senate or Governor would, Carlin would veto it. Hayden ran on. Uh, elect me, I'll, I'll sign the death penalty. And, and uh, so uh, in his first term, he, uh, we got it, it got through the House and went over to the Senate. Bob Fry then was a senator and he was uh, chairman of the Senate committee. He had taken up with Wanda Fuller from uh, Wichita, Kansas, and uh, both of them ultimately, ultimately divorced their spouses. And before she died, they got married, like mm -hmm. the day before she died. Mm -hmm. But she had quite an influence on him, and she was opposed to the death oh. penalty. And Bob came around to that way of thinking. And Car uh, Hayden called up uh, uh, Bob Fry, and he said, Bob, I need your help on this. And uh, Senator Fry said, uh, Governor, it's taken me a long time to get to where I am, but I am where I am, and you can't have my help on this. <laughs> So yeah. he didn't. Uh, Hayden never got the death penalty while he was governor. Yeah. Um, so again, and we maybe kind of touched on it, but uh, if you look over your 14 years, your biggest legislative success would be. 
uh, or that you were involved in, maybe not. Maybe yeah, not I, I really, I really don't. Uh, I, I really wouldn't want to say one thing. That yeah, there was okay. many, yeah. many, many things, yeah. and uh, and uh, some of them I've talked about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about on the other side? Maybe you're. 14 years and your biggest disappointment that something that you'd maybe worked hard either yeah. up front or behind the scenes trying to get something passed I, that I never quite got across I the I can't finish recall. Line. I, I, we got most things uh, passed that we wanted passed either through subterfuge or amendments <laughs> or when we were in the majority, it wasn't that difficult to get things passed. Yeah. When you're in the minority, you can say anything because it doesn't make any difference. Nobody <laughs> listens to you. But when you're in the majority, you got to be in your committee chair. You got to be careful what you say because it could end up in, in the in the statute, as, as you know. <laughs> well, yeah. Didn't the chairman say this? <laughs> um, let's. Uh, this is this required personal identity question that mm -hmm. I uh, kind of mentioned, and so I'll just read it, and then however you'd like to respond. Again, this is a question we're asking um, all the people that are being interviewed. Okay. But so personal identity is loosely defined as gender age, race, class, sexual or gender orientation, marital status, etc. Did you experience times during your time in the legislature where you believe your personal identity influenced your ability to pass policy, work with fellow legislators, or provide constituent services? Were you ever given committee assignments or tasks you believe were functions of your personal identity? I don't think so. Don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, and then maybe kind of a, again, kind of looking back over the 14 years, um, I guess, were there changes in the legislative institution mm -hmm. over those 14 years? Either, I don't know, operating more efficiently, maybe less harmoniously. Uh, yeah, did the person's word really mean something in that first mm -hmm. session and that last session? I didn't notice any uh, remarkable changes. I, I really mm -hmm. didn't. It changes every time you get a new legislator. Right. But uh, uh, it, it, it was, I know the legislature changed over time. Uh, who was the legislator from, he was, he chaired the Judiciary Committee before I did. Mm. Um, his father, Paul Wunsch, oh. uh, Paul Wunsch uh, was a senator, and people used to talk about, I don't, did you know Paul Wunsch? Yeah. <laughs> they used to talk about him going over here and sitting down in the uh, lobby of the Jayhawk Hotel and playing cards, and people would come up to him and whisper in his ear about mm. what they wanted uh, this done or that done, and that's how uh, he ran the Senate. Uh, uh, we didn't have, I don't think, much of that. The, uh, uh, I found the, um, the uh, social gatherings to be very beneficial. Uh, that's how I got to know uh, Marvin Littlejohn. Mm -hmm. He very different people. He, he's a conservative uh, a liquor store owner from Phillipsburg, <laughs> Kansas, and I'm a more liberal lawyer from Lawrence, Kansas. But we, we got along, we knew uh, we had shared some experiences and, and uh, we respected each other, but we had very different constituencies and different uh, political philosophies. But it was those social functions that allowed us uh, to do that. And I think that that is important, I don't know if that continues today the way that it used to. Uh, now, R.H. Miller, uh, he was the type of guy that if you did something for him, he felt like he had to do something for you. Mm. And he felt that so strongly mm. that he refused to go to those oh. social functions unless he paid his own way. And he didn't go to any of them unless if there was one he felt he should go to, then he found out what the cost was, he paid the cost, and then he went to it. Uh, that's just the way he was. But uh, when I first came to the legislature, uh, let's see, who was the speaker before Wendell Lady? Uh, let's see. Who? Was it, yeah, Carlin? No, 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 before Carlin. 
uh, is a Republican. Miguel, Miguel Pete Miguel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was talking to Pete Miguel one time. Uh, uh, I, we had a uh, little family corporation, and we had a standing mortgage on a farm out in Riley County. And when we needed money for a project, we'd go to the bank, and based upon that mortgage, they'd put the money in our account, and we'd do the project, we'd pay it back. And, and my brother had a project out in California, and I went to the banker and asked, uh, we were borrowing $25,000 or something like that. Usually the money was in there within a few days. Well, the money didn't get into the account. And we were dealing with a banking bill, branch banking bill, and... Uh, and uh, he comes over to my office, and he comes in and talks to me, and he says, how do you go and vote on that banking bill? <laughs> I said, well, my constituents, my banks and Lawrence want me to vote in favor of it. He said, we're an independent bank, and we wouldn't be doing the things for you that we do for you if we were an independent bank, and this bill will change that. And I, I hoping, I'm hoping that you'll vote, for, for, vote against that bill. And I was very disturbed by that. I uh, ushered him out of my office, and I went to Pete McGill, and uh, there was another bank lobbyist, I can't remember what his name was right now, and told him about that. And uh, uh, they said that I had a couple of choices. Uh, I said, uh, they said they could talk with him privately because that's not the way it's done. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, I said, go ahead and handle it privately. But Pete McGill says, you know, around here, he says, uh, uh, you, you drink their wine and you eat their food and you screw their women. I said, I, I'm not sure my wife would understand <laughs> that part. And he, well, that's mostly in Washington, he says. And then you vote the way you want to vote. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh did I answer your yeah, question? Yeah, no, you, yeah, 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 he, he did, he did. So, um, so, uh, so 14 years, and of course you've done a lot of things since then. Would you ever see yourself any inkling of ever returning to elected office or I, I your... doubt if that's going to happen. <laughs> I'm 74 years old now, and that's too old to run for just about anything. <laughs> And I, I did my duty. I was here for 14 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess so if somebody came to you and said, hey, I'm thinking about running for the legislature, what would you, what would you tell that person? I'd tell them good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, people run for lots of dis different reasons. Uh, and... Uh, 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 there, there's a lot of work to be uh, done over here, but uh, again, I, I felt I was elected to come over here and do work for my constituents. Mm -hmm. I wasn't here to make friends with lobbyists and staff and and uh, and legislators, right. and uh, I and I tried not to do that. I tried to, but I but there, but I did enjoy the collegiality yeah. of of uh, lobbyists and staff and legislators. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's got to be, I think, from your perspective, uh, very fulfilling to look back over those 14 years and all the issues that you touched or mm -hmm. dealt with, the uh, mm -hmm. policy you helped set. Yeah, I, I, I still have people, uh, it hasn't happened to me recently, but as many as 20 years after I left, people would come up to me and tell me that I was doing a good job in the that I had been there. Yeah, yeah, well, it certainly... Uh, done a great job in terms of public service, and uh, certainly Kansas is better off for uh, for so. for your efforts. So, yeah. any other topics or issues, maybe that I didn't raise, or anything that you would like to no, maybe can't. share? For again, this will be, you know, be saved for researchers and educators uh, going forward. And yeah. uh, I I uh, I think that uh, uh, as as Winston Churchill said. Uh, a democracy is the very worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried. Uh, and uh, democracy is, is hard work. Uh, for many periods in history, people don't pay much attention. They vote for who they always voted for. Things get done and so on and so forth. Yeah. And once in a while you have those uh, issues that come up that... Uh, uh, but uh, if we have... Uh, 
uh, people running for office and holding office for the right reasons uh, to actually serve their constituents uh, and people study the issues and uh, and respect the Constitution. You just don't, I mean, <laughs> when you take an oath to uphold the Constitution, uh, it should mean something. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, uh, we can, uh, in democracy, there's plenty of opportunities to make mistakes, but there's mm -hmm. plenty of opportunities <laughs> to correct those mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and we talk about term limits. I've never been a proponent of term limits. Uh, if, uh, uh, when, when you don't want it so bad that you can taste it, it's time to leave. <laughs> and, uh, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Well, uh, thank you for thank your you. service. Thank, thank you, you for spending some time yeah. with us uh, today, and uh, we wish you all the best going forward. Thank you. So, thank you.